<laughs> Welcome, Claire. Consider the area you are in a special playground I have prepared just for you. Please try and keep me amused, and do not disappoint me by dying too soon. I so want to enjoy this. <laughs> Resident Evil Code Veronica is Resident Evil campiness taken to the max. It has ghouls awakening in cemeteries, spooky gothic mansions, evil villains who do evil laughs, and Steve. Don't get me wrong, this is one of the best original RE games out there, but if you love Resident Evil for its campiness, well, that explains why this entry is a lot of people's favorite. There have been many different versions of Code Veronica release, such as the original on Dreamcast and the HD remaster on PS3. We'll be taking a look at Code Veronica X, the port of the game on PS2, playable on the PSN store. This version adds some more cutscenes and, most importantly, changes Steve's hair to make him look less like Leonardo DiCaprio. Well, let's get on with it. Code Veronica often goes overlooked in the grand scheme of things being a spin-off title. Development began in 1998 after Resident Evil 2. All previous mainline entries were released exclusively on the PS1. Capcom won an RE game for Sega's new upcoming console, the Dreamcast. Shinji Mikami, creator of the Resident Evil franchise, stated that he wanted to keep all the numbered entries on PlayStation while doing various spin-off games on other consoles. It's sort of up in the air on which RE game is the real sequel or spin-off, with RE3 starting life as a spin-off and sharing a lot of similar locations and mechanics with RE2, while Code Veronica is a much bigger game both technically and in scope. At the time, Capcom had multiple Resident Evils in the oven, like RE3, Zero, Re make and Kamiya's Resident Evil project that became Devil May Cry. This means that a lot of work on the game got outsourced to other developers, with Sega even lending a hand at one point. The original script followed Jill on a Stars mission in Europe, chasing after Hilbert and Hilda Kruger, and fighting Nazi zombies on a U-boat, which frankly sounds amazing. Later on, the Krugers were changed to the Ashfords, and the Nazi zombies became nondescript soldiers. Resident Evil Code Veronica released on February 3rd, 2000 exclusively on the Dreamcast and then a bunch more times. Resident Evil Code Veronica was the first, at the time, next generation Resident Evil, and being a classic Resident Evil game, Code Veronica uses tank controls. Up and down on D-pad move you front and back, while left and right rotate you on the spot. At this point you either find these controls horribly dated, or consider them a nice warm comfort blanket. They work to induce unequivocal amounts of stress every time you have to go anywhere. You traverse the areas, finding items, solving puzzles at your leisure, as zombies get in your way. Code Veronica is much more action focused than previous titles, gone are the days of the lone zombie strolling the hall. CB throws as many enemies as it can possibly fit into a room at you. To compensate for this, there's what feels like an emphasis on automatic or rapid fire weapons rather than precise powerful ones. Code Veronica introduces dual wielding. This allows you to target two enemies at one time and it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Busting down a door and unloading twin Uzis on a bunch of zombies is just next level. You get all the weapons from RE3, an assault rifle and a sniper rifle, as well as the aforementioned twin Uzis. To balance that out, Code Veronica has you watching your ammo. Conserving supplies is the name of the game. You have a limited amount of ammo and healing items to get you through the game. Use them up too early and, well, let's say the game is very open-ended. It, it's got a lot of opportunities for you to screw yourself over. The story follows Claire three months after the events of Resident Evil 2 as she infiltrates an umbrella facility. After taking out some guards in a normal fashion, Claire gets arrested and is sent to Rockford Island. The island is attacked by an unknown force and Claire is let go by the unluckiest NPC in gaming history, Rodrigo Juan Raval, an umbrella commander. Making her way through a cemetery, the dead come back to life, and once again, Claire must enter the survival horror. Here she meets Steve. Wait, wait, don't you? Steve? Am I dreaming or is that you, Harrington? Yeah, it's me, don't cream your pants. Now Steve is objectively the best character in the game because he's objectively the worst. Right away you notice Code Veronica fully utilizing the Dreamcast then next-gen power to make the first Resident Evil game with fully 3D environments. Previous games used pre-rendered 2D backgrounds to save computational power. Fully 3D environments made out of age as well, but lets the fixed camera pan across the frame which makes moving from different angles a much smoother transition and gives the game an overall more cinematic feel. It comes bundled with this time attack mode called Battle Game, where you clear a room as fast as 
that you can with infinite ammo. And because it's the first RE game to have fully 3D environments, there's a first person mode. It's how it works, making aiming and spotting enemies a hell of a lot easier. Shame it's not an option for the story campaign. The first tutorial area you go through is the prison. You know the drill, lock door, find clues, do something logical that makes sense. Unlock the door. The prison area knows it's in a Resident Evil game. There's a corridor with a metal detector where you can't take any weapons with you and there's conveniently placed windows. It's not a matter of if, but when. You have to go down this damn hallway at least like four times completely defenseless. This area has got your basic zombies and the Cerberus zombie dogs, which are the worst. Nothing wrong with them, it's a personal gripe. They're easy enough to take out, I, I just don't like them. Once you leave the area, the game opens up with two branching paths. The game gives you enough freedom to complete the area in any way you please. Code Veronica doesn't have a difficulty slider, you make your own life difficult. Claire arrives at this grandiose palace with a couple of things to pick up. When she's about to exit the palace, Claire hears Steve crying for help. Yeah! Help me! Steve? Claire proceeds to save Steve in return for his golden... Nope. Steve acts ungrateful and runs off. Steve! Heading back, Claire runs into Alfred Ashford. Him and his sister Alexia own Rockford Island and they're just cartoonishly evil. <laughs> They have this creepy ass home video of them as kids mutilating a dragonfly. Anyway, Alfred menaces Claire and then leaves. Taking the second path leads to the military training facility. You're greeted by this giant sandworm that can one hit kill you if you're not careful. Code Veronica's got a lot of these instant death moments that do feel a bit cheap at times. A lot of old games used to increase difficulty to increase game length, but CV is one of the lengthiest RE games to date. It's also the first to have a checkpoint system. Before certain moments or boss fights, the game checkpoints you, preventing a loss of progress, which sort of means the game knows when it's goofing off. One of the standout puzzles in the game is the family heritage puzzle. It's sort of given to you as a riddle to solve while also giving you a better understanding of the characters. It's simple, put these members of the Ashford family in the correct order. I don't know, I just thought it was a good quiet time and worth mentioning. You eventually come to an underground area with twin Uzis. Here Claire is attacked by a deadly bandersnatch. Who but Steve comes to the rescue. Don't worry, Claire. Your knight in shining armor is here. You wish. He swaps Claire the Lugers for the Twin Uzis and both join forces to fight the bio threat until Steve is confronted by a demon from his past. What's wrong, Steve? Shoot him! Wait! I... I can't! No! Steve! Steve. The Bandersnatch enemies become irregular. These guys all look like giant blobs of snot to me. They've got these long arms that used to grab you as well as using them to move around and cut you off. They're far more aggressive than your average zombie and they're there to cause you some serious problems. The Golden Lugers unlock a secret passage to the second gothic mansion on a hill and it's just spooky to the max. It's covered in fog as you approach with ruins outside. The inside is swarming with bats and creepy dolls. This is easily my favorite location in the game. A full on Adam's family haunted mansion. Here, Claire and Steve meet up again until they're ambushed by Alexia, Alfred's twin sister. They fight, but wait, what's this? A wig? What? No! Wait a second. What just happened? Claire and Steve escape the island that's about to be bombed. On the way to the escape jet, a tyrant shows up. What's an RE game with that bosser that really tests your patience? Code Veronica really takes the cake when it comes to ammo dump boss fights. Most have you standing in one spot, unloading all the weapons you've been savoring throughout the game. They're not as much of a challenge as they are roadblocks between levels. Bosses are simple enough if you have the ammo. 
But if you don't, like I said, Code Veronica has more than enough opportunities for you to screw yourself over. The tyrant can one-shot you by throwing you onto the fire. The only real tactic is to unload on his ass. Claire and Steve board the plane, when all of a sudden there's a disturbance in the cargo hold. This tyrant boss, the second tyrant boss in the game, is iconic for its sheer tomfoolery. The goal is simple. Do enough damage so that the tyrant is weak enough so you can jettison it from the plane. Simple, right? The problem being this takes place right after what felt like the climax of the game. You just did a daring escape fighting tooth and nail to get to the cargo jet and now you're on it and there's no way to find more ammo. Your only option is to reload an older save or bash your head against the wall till you get lucky. This boss fight ends the game for a lot of people, which is a shame because you still have two thirds of the game left. Anyway, you dump his ass only to find Alfred has rerouted you to an umbrella base in the Antarctic. This area is quite a bit smaller than the island, for Claire anyway. There's a cool bonus room and a conveniently placed safe room. One piece of Japanese Resident Evil weirdness is the machine room key. It's hidden under a plant pot, which is fine, and it's completely normal to hide keys under plant pots when they're outside your house. This plant pot is the only object in the 4x4 room. In the Antarctic base, we meet a new enemy, in what I like to call the worst hallway in gaming history. It's patrolled by these giant mutated moths that deal instant poison damage. Somehow, without fail, they latched onto me every time. Up to this point, the game has given you two blue herbs. Something I noticed on a second playthrough is the blue herb planted conveniently near the door. How the hell was I supposed to notice that when I'm running for my life? Puzzles in this area have you unnecessarily backtracking to find key items to progress. You need the aforementioned machine room key by turning on the power and the gas mask by doing the barcode puzzle. Also, you can go to a room that has a single item in it, the one you need to beat the level. After you do that, a showdown happens between Steve and Alfred. This leads to one of the better bosses in the game, Nosferatu. There's some excellent foreshadowing before the fight, and the way he just appears out of the fog still sends chills down my spine. him, you use Alfred's rifle to hit his weak spot. He's blind so he'll follow the sounds of your footsteps and gunshots. Get too close and Nosferatu will knock you off the helipad. This is one of the boss fights that checkpoints you right before, so the one hit kills aren't the worst. Afterwards, Claire and Steve plan to escape by a snowplow this time, but wait. What's this? Alfred reawakens his real, actual, not fake twin sister Alexia. Claire and Steve are knocked out by a giant tentacle. Cut to Special Tactics and Rescue Services operator Chris frickin' Redfield scaling the cliff face. Upon reaching the island, Chris runs into yet again mortally wounded Rodrigo. Chris asks him about his sister Claire. Just before he can say anything, Rodrigo is swooped up by a giant sandworm. This leads to an optional boss where if you're playing the game correctly, you probably screwed yourself over. You enter an arena with the exit elevator slowly coming down. You run into the sandworm with just a pistol because Claire has all the good weapons equipped. You remember from before when you weren't supposed to fight the sandworm, so you assume the goal is just to survive. However, if you do leave without killing the sandworm, Rodrigo dies with a lighter, meaning you never get the twin Uzis for Chris and the Magnum, the most powerful weapon in the game. This has to be a common occurrence. They even tell you in big bold text, you have to save him. The boss fight, it's... It's Yawn the Snake again. Now is a good time to talk about the cutscenes. There's a surprising amount of player choice in this game, so the weapon you have equipped shows up in the cutscene rather than a character just holding a pistol, which was a nice touch. Different cutscenes play, sometimes depending on which order you do things in. It's an extra level of polish that isn't required, but is welcome. Chris explores the now desolated Rockford Island, only to run into his old friend, Special Tactics and Rescue Services Commander, Albert Goddamn Wesker. Wesker unleashes hunters onto you. These come in two variants, poison and non-poison. They're more aggressive than regular zombies and can duck under your shot. A new addition are these laser traps put out by Wesker. You can avoid these, making most encounters with the hunters optional. As for Rockford Island, old pathways become blocked and new pathways and areas open up. The main structure you go through is this three-story building connected by an elevator. Here's where you find the shotgun, which controls the stairs leading out of the area. It's got some unremarkable brisk puzzles and some encounters which lead to the boss fight with the albinoid, a mutated salamander that emits electricity. You find it in a pool of water guarding a key item. It's, it's harmless. You can just shoot at it from the safety of the ledge or just run in and grab the item. Later on, Chris and Wesker both learn that Claire and Alexia are in Antarctica, so they make their way there. The entire base has frozen over from Claire and Steve's escape. Similar to Rockford Island, the damages have opened up new areas for Chris to explore. At this point, the game begins wearing down on you. There's not much new in the Antarctic facility other than some jarring puzzles, like this one that has you transposing symbols with a cipher in mirrored order, or this puzzle that has you switching the power back off because it gave you a hint about it a couple hours ago, or this one which is the exact 
exact same as the music box puzzle back on Rockford Island. It does, however, have some good scares in it, but at this point enemies don't feel as threatening after dealing with them for so long. The first boss fight is with a giant black widow. Come on, it's just a spider again. This one is, again, totally optional. So if you've seen it before, you can just leave. And I hear you like mansions, so I put some mansions in your mansion. Chris finds a mansion reminiscent of the Spencer Mansion. This was a really cool surprise, albeit the third mansion in the game, but entirely unexpected. Claire is trapped under some goop and has been poisoned. Chris returns with serum only for Alexia to show herself. Claire chases after her in search for Steve. People really don't like this section for reasons I will get into. For starters, there's not a single typewriter in the entire area, but it does have a checkpoint at the start. So if you happen to die, that's where you'd go. Which wouldn't be a problem, but you've got the crystal ball puzzle. It's simple. Drop the crystal ball under the giant stone slab, then proceed to pick it up from under the giant stone slab with tank controls. It's trial and error and can get frustrating, repeating it over and over again. Eventually, Claire finds Steve restrained. It turns out, Alexia had infected him with the T-Veronica virus. Okay, some quick backstory. So, Veronica Ashford is sort of the Ashford's oldest known relative, so Alexander Ashford wanted to clone Veronica because it's the, um only way to enhance intelligence. This is how Alexia and Alfred were born. Alfred was smart, but Alexia, an exact clone of Veronica, was a genius. She created the T-Veronica virus, which lets the host control bioweapons infected with the T-Virus. She tested this out on her father, who turned into Nosferatu. The virus worked, but it needed time to gestate, which is why after injecting herself with the T-Veronica virus, Alexia went into cryosleep until her body accepted the virus, leaving Alfred to take care of business while she was away. Now that she's awake, her virus works and she's ready to take over the world or some shit. Anyway, Steve turns into the fifth ninja turtle and tries to kill Claire. Biggest gripe number two with the area, this boss fight, which is one of those run towards the camera sort of deal. Steve can kill you with two hits. He will, guaranteed, hit you at least three times. And if you die, it's back to the start before the crystal ball puzzle. Steve later comes to his senses and saves Claire from a tentacle and gets fatally wounded in the process. Your brother kept his promise. I'm sorry, I cannot. Now, I like Steve. Is he a creep? Yes. Is he annoying? Yes. Is his voice acting laughable? Yes. Meanwhile, Wesker fights Alexia and then escapes, leaving Chris to finish the job. Now, this is my favorite boss fight in the entire game and definitely top 5 in the franchise. Alexia can insta-kill you if she grabs Chris. That's a non-issue because the game checkpoints before the boss fight. She doesn't take too much ammo to down and you just have to be cautious. What Alexia can do is create these barriers of fire with her blood. It's very easy to get boxed in and have nowhere to go, so you're constantly trying to outmaneuver her while shooting back. After dealing with Alexia, Chris runs to save Claire, but in order to save Claire, Chris must activate the base's self-destruct system. He enters the confirmation code Veronica. Alexia shows up again in an irredeemable boss fight. She's just a pile of goop. She spits poison, she's got tentacles and these annoying little bugs. All you do here is dump the remainder of your ammo into her. Then finish her off with a linear launcher that's there conveniently. There's one more tussle with Wesker in a cutscene, which is a great cutscene, but a cutscene nonetheless. Chris and Claire escape, swearing to stop Umbrella once and for all. Yeah, it's payback time. We've got to destroy Umbrella. Now, let's finish this once and for all. And that was Resident Evil Code Veronica. Everything you love and hate about Resident Evil turned up to 11. CV has this undeniable charm, from the spooky mansions to the over-the-top cartoon villains that become a staple of the franchise. Yeah, it's got its flaws, clunky controls, terrible voice acting, and a stale third act. If you're new to this franchise, it probably won't convince you, and if you're old, you don't need convincing. Resident Evil Code Veronica is the most Resident Evil Resident Evil. What was that all about? 